Well, I want to thank uh, Julie and everyone here for coming out. I know that it's uh, pretty blustery out there, especially for Los Angeles this evening. So uh, for those of you on Zoom and those of you in the audience, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time out to listen to me describe uh, some of my um, you know, first loves here in the study of uh, marine invertebrates, uh, which would be uh, these whale parasites that I'm going to talk about or whale associates. And so um, I also want to start by saying that I really uh, love this aquarium. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's been a while since I've uh, been at Cabrillo. It's an aquarium that I always recommend. People are looking for a place to visit. Um, it's, you know, it's easy for me to imagine the excitement on the, the faces of the thousands of kids that roam through that, that Julie just mentioned because I, I just saw one of them in the aquarium glass as I was peeking through and that was me. Um, that I have a little fish tank at home, um, I should say invertebrate tank, and uh, I, I'm much better at culturing algae, I must say, because I can, I can barely see through. <laughs> the glass, whereas here the tanks are pristine. It's clear there's a lot of care that goes into the exhibits and, and certainly all the uh, education program and everything else that goes on. So again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and, and share what I have to say. Um, these whale parasites or these uh, whale lice are not the lice that um, one typically speaks of. You know, So these, these are um, animals that we find on whales, dolphins, and porpoises, but the, the use of the word lice uh, is, is simply to describe um, their habit of existing on the whale. And these are not uh, organisms that are tightly, um, or closely, I should say, related to uh, the, the other beautiful creatures that you might see here. Uh, I, I chose this for you just to... Uh, you know, yeah, get some of these these prettier images out of the way. This is uh, these are um, this human lice or body lice that you see on the left. There was like there are lice on badgers, uh, which is what you see in the middle. Uh, bird lice. There are all sorts of species. There's a whole variety of uh, creatures out there that we uh, might or might not know about. Um, when it comes to whale lice, they're arthropods. So uh, I want to start with a little bit of an orientation. The these uh, animals are, are animals that we know as arthropods, they uh, molt. Uh, they're members of the ecdysozoa. Those are organisms that, that actually molt as, as they grow in order to grow, actually. You can just imagine uh, existing in a suit of armor, that exoskeleton. This is something that they have to shed in order to grow. Um, and then they've got a complete gut, so they have a mouth, they have an anus, that's one way. Let's be thankful that we're organized similarly. Um, you have an open circulatory system, so it's different from you know vertebrates, and they're different from vertebrates in that way too. Um, this is, of course, not a whale louse that I have, but a scorpion. Just to show you that um, we uh, see segmentation of the body. The segments are um, you are arranged as tagmata, or in otherwise, in other words, uh, special regions of the body that are functionally related in some way. Uh, their name, arthropod, uh, refers to the fact that they've got jointed appendages. Um, these are paired appendages that arise from those uh, body segments or somites. And, and so those are some of the key features um, that we use to distinguish uh, what really is the most speciose or species-rich uh, group of animals on the planet. In fact, we've, we've described some 1.7 million species and change. And that uh, is a number that includes all plants and bacteria and um, animals and fungi and you name it, all sorts of other fantastic lineages uh, of organisms that inhabit our planet. And, and so what I'm saying is that um, a full uh, half of those and more are arthropods. Um, it's of course within the arthropoda that we have uh, the crustaceans that I wish to talk about tonight. So um, that's where we're sitting, is, is looking, looking at uh, organisms that exist within that phylum. And I'm showing you this classification uh, because it's the one that you'll find in most textbooks and it's the one that I learned. And it's the one that I've taught recently, uh, not too long ago. Um, but as we explore these organisms and as we find more species and as we and try to understand those that we, we already know exist, uh, we 
learn more about how they're related, uh, looking at DNA, looking at uh, new aspects with the, the new tools that we have for uh, microscopy and uh, other, other modes of observation. And we, we come up with new um, ideas about their relationships. Uh, we come up with new hypotheses uh, about how evolution has unfolded into this great diversity of life. And so we're really um, talking about uh, organisms that exist now within uh, a group known as uh, pan crustacea. So uh, whereas on, on the left we have uh, the myriapoda, those are centipedes and millipedes as you can gather by the name, uh, myriad, you know, uh, pod refers to the uh, foot. Um, hexapoda, six legs, I think that's something you probably remember from you know biology classes, the six-legged insects. So the hexapoda are the insects and then uh, we had crustacea, uh, crabs, sh shrimps, lobsters, and then a wide array of other organisms that you might uh, have never heard of and that's you know part of my purpose for being here is to um, share uh, one of those one of those tiny groups within crustacea and then chelicerata scorpion spiders ticks mites well we found that uh, uh, not too surprisingly insects the most uh, diverse animal group on the planet are actually just uh, beautiful crustaceans. And so um, those are both lumped in the same group now, pan crustacea, to, to further my description of that. And so uh, we're going to head to here on uh, the arthropod tree and take a peek at um, a group called the amphipoda. Most amphipods, and this is a speciose group, this is a really um, you know, rich group when it comes to the number of species. Uh, we've got uh, over 10,000. Uh, and this number has changed uh, since I was uh, working at the museum. Uh, it's, it's grown by, the estimate has grown by thousands. And uh, if you talk to people who work on amphipods, uh, of course, and you think about all the little interstices of every little coral reef and you know, deep sea environment and uh, patch of soil across the planet, um, you'll, you'll get numbers that are far greater than this when it comes to the estimates that they might share. Um, but you know, by comparison, there are about 6,500 species of all mammals. So that's, those are the kind of numbers that we're dealing with. And if you look at the um, animal in the center here, this is the subject of our talk tonight. And I'll speak a little bit about these guys on the right. Uh, some of you might have seen these in, uh, or remember them from uh, biology coursework. Some of you at the aquarium, I'm sure are familiar with these uh, skeleton shrimp that we have on the right. And there's a reason that I'll, I'll include them in the talk tonight. Um, most amphipods are actually laterally compressed. So side to side, um, their bodies uh, tend to look like those on, on the left. And it might be a little bit difficult to see in the actual slide, but when you look at a whale louse, um, they're much more like the uh, many of, not all, but many of the isopoda related group where they're dorsal ventrally uh, flattened. And so uh, the bodies of these tend to be flattened. And really when you, when you think about uh, you know, these guys being on whales and dolphins and porpoises cruising through um, the, the sea, uh, it, it makes some degree of sense that they've got a low profile and they'll have features that add in their attachment to the host too that we'll, we'll take a look at. And then you've got other sorts of amphipods in the group that we uh, don't have uh, too much time to, to spend upon now that are associated with other organisms, salps and other things in the, in the marine environment, hyperiod amphipods. Um, you know, you could go, again, you could go on and on with the, the list of uh, these different types of um, small creatures that just uh, don't make the headlines that people, unless they dig into the um, marine realm, don't understand actually exist. Um, and again, that's that's understandable. Uh, with well well lice, uh, they might they're a little uh, more high profile, I think, than than most organisms of their size because they're on a gigantic moving island, right? And they're they're on a very popular group of organisms. Understandably, um, again, the cetacea, the whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So um, this is. Um, uh, an image of one of our, our chubby little whale eyes here. And again, when you look at this, this guy on the left, oops, I just exited. Give me one second to pop back in. Okay, so when you look at this, this one um, in the image on the left, that's uh, only about two centimeters long. So that's the scale that we're dealing, dealing with. And then you might recall that I just showed you a skeleton shrimp on that, that last slide in the upper right. Um, I will mention them from time to time and that's because these guys, um, if you look on the, at the line drawing that I, that I did on the left, 
you've got a whale house and on the right you've got a skeleton shrimp. Um, these are completely different um, beasts, but when you uh, look at the antennae, which is marked you know, A1, and I've got abbreviations for their different appendages, periopods is what you call this, those, those, those limbs, which is why it says PD. Uh, LG stands for lateral gill. Those are the gills of the organisms, and you can see them again in the, the real image on the left. But if you look at the, the halves of the organisms that I've put together, you'll see that their morphology is actually quite similar. Um, and uh, I believe these to be uh, the, the coprelids or the skeleton shrimp as they're called to be the sister taxa, the most closely related organisms to the whale eyes. Um, again, just for scales, you can understand uh, the, the, the giant nature of these, these animals. Um, that's the biggest one there. That's, the, that's uh, Siamis scamoni. That's from uh, the gray whale. That's uh, a species that's found only on the gray whale. And you can see it's not much larger than the size of one's fingertip. Um, again, when it comes to these, one of the interesting things is they, these animals are found only on whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Um, you'll find great numbers of them on the, the baleen whales, on the mysticity, uh, very few of them um, per whale in general on um, tooth whales. But when it comes to looking across the um, nearly seven, several dozen species of uh, whale lice, um, this one, Siamis scamoni, is, is by far the, the largest. Uh, many are quite small. There are some that are just a few millimeters uh, across. And so uh, there's a big size range within the whale lice, but overall, uh, you know, for most people, these are, these are tiny animals. Um, and you might wonder how one becomes interested in, in studying them. I, I went, uh, when I was at NAU, Northern Arizona University, I went to uh, northern, the Northern Sea of Cortez, um, the Gulf of California, you know, quite often to participate in some sampling for a lab. And it's there that um, I first saw a skeleton shrimp, you know, dancing around in the tide pools. Um, and the only way I saw that was to actually take time and really peer into that pool and, and um, observe it for a while. And then out of the corner of your eye, you know, you see something a little moving, a little that's moving around, it looks like pocket lint. Um, nothing very exciting to the naked eye at first, but when you put these things under a microscope, it's a whole new world. It goes from pocket lint to Godzilla very quickly. Um, and, and they have all sorts of interesting behaviors. Not a whole lot of behavior after they've been preserved in ethanol for morphological work or DNA work, but if you look at these uh, organisms live, there's also a whole uh, you know, world in, within the realm of ecology uh, that, that needs to be understood. And so we'll, we'll revisit that too. Um, but we have, we have these animals from about 40 different species of um, cetaceans. And so, uh, you know, you've got over half of cetacea uh, having some sort of uh, whale louse uh, uh, reported in association with them. I want to mention at the same time that when we look at the uh, epibiotic fauna, when we look at the organisms that occur upon the whale, uh, or dolphin or porpoise in this case, uh, we have a whole host of other organisms too. In fact, I was keeping a list at some point on parasites of cetacea in general, everything in, from uh, spiny-headed worms to um, you know, tapeworms to barnacles and so on. And I think, if I recall correctly, the sperm whale uh, was the one that ended up winning or losing, depending on how you're looking at it, in the sense that uh, it had uh, some 27 species of parasites recorded from it. Not an individual, uh, hopefully, but uh, you know, overall across the literature. And so uh, there are other organisms that hang on the surface of the whales and the, the, the nature of their symbiotic association might vary um, in, in, in terms of the barnacles. You'll, when you read the literature, uh, you'll see them referred to as parasites in, in uh, one instance and as uh, commensals or those that don't, you know, that really neither benefit nor harm harm the whale in any serious way, uh, on the other hand. So it, it depends on what barnacle, probably what situation, and what uh, person you're talking to. Uh, but barnacles um, certainly dig in and, and burrow into the flesh of the whale when they settle. Um, there are a couple kinds shown here. Uh, Xenobalanus is one, core 
Nula is another. There are, uh, there are other genera. Here you see, um, it, it would be difficult to read the names, I would imagine, um, in the, that piece of artwork there. But uh, you see the barnacle of the gray whale on the right. And without looking to see the whale, or out, without actually looking at the barnacle, the nice thing here is that I could look at the back of that whale house, because that's what you see as a film. Let's see if I can use the mouse without exiting the slideshow here. Uh, you'll see this orange coloration in between the barnacles. And indeed, you can see this in photographs um, from afar. That is, you can see it in, in pictures of whales. You'll see the coloration uh, that is produced by the existence of many, many hundreds of these whale eyes around uh, barnacles and other areas of the host animal. When you see um, this one, I can tell that it's that same Siamis scamoni that I, I showed you before named after the same individual at Scammons Lagoon down in Baja, of course, is named after. Um, and then you actually see um, these barnacles, which are also crustacea, by the way, um, you, uh, that they are alive and you can see that they are, um, you know, providing housing in some senses for the, the whale eyes. Um, one of the interesting things that I want to mention about uh, the differences here between a whale louse and another crustacean like a barnacle, uh, aside from the obvious, uh, would be uh, their life cycle. When you look at the pictures that I've got at the top, you know, barnacles have um, larvae that are dispersed into the water column, into the seawater, away from the host animal. Um, you'll have a nauplius larva, which is the one you see on the left. You'll have a cyprid larva. Eventually they'll settle. You'll have a juvenile barnacle, and then it'll grow into um, something with a test such as what you see in the upper right and what you see in the larger image um, as an adult. Whale lice, however, um, have no larvae. Their entire life history, their entire uh, life cycle, I should say, is spent on the surface of the whale or the dolphin or the porpoise. So without a free swimming stage, um, they are reliant entirely upon the host. And in fact, I would uh, suppose that if they, they fall off, they become fish food or otherwise perish. Um, they are found in different places on the whale. And so if you look at something like a right whale, um, here with its callocytes, um, the rough skin that produces cal cal what are called callocytes on right whales in particular, um, you would see uh, Siamis ovalis, which is actually uh, what I would consider now looking at the taxonomy, Siamis abbreviatus. I don't really expect that anyone's going to be kind of become enthralled with the intricacies of what uh, the name should be. But, you know, when a species is described initially, um, that initial author, that, that first author, uh, is given credit for that species, but it could be the case that down the line that same species uh, sampled elsewhere is given a different name by a different person who is unaware of the first description. And so taxonomists have to play that game of constantly kind of evaluating those detective stories as part of the thing that's in, it's interesting to me is the, um, the detective work that goes into uh, what was described when and where was it found and what was it like. You know? And so uh, in any case, there is a species that exist primarily in association with these callocytes that exist on right whales. There's a species, another species, Siamis gracilis, that occurs around that, a little further toward the base of those callocytes. And then there's one in less desirable reaches, a little further back on the underside, um, associated with folds related to um, a genital region or to areas where there might be wounds, et cetera, and that's Siamis erraticus. And so there's a little bit of localization on these moving islands. And, and that's uh, really how you, you I know that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of love probably for the cetacea in, in, the, in the room here, but it's the case that these, these uh, whales and dolphins and porpoises, these hosts, are really, just think of them as moving islands, as habitats for these um, other, other more important, I'm sorry to say that, organisms. And so um, when, you, when you look at the callocytes a little close up, do you see how they're white up front? Do you see that, that, that white coloration? Those are actually dark gray. Um, they're, they appear white because of the many thousands of whale lice that are on the surface. And then you have that other species there. Um, 
in the, the orange color. Now, I, I want to confess, I, I would love to get out and, and see all this, but most of what I say, I should tell you. You'll see the credits that I have for the different photos, et cetera. I want to be up front and say, uh, I, don't, I don't go out and grab these myself. Um, and I haven't had the opportunity to really see them dancing around live other than in videos and such. Most of what I see is through a microscope or through a jar, you know, and so, but there's a lot that you can, you can tell. And there's been some fantastic work done um, that I'll highlight since I last gave serious attention to these. Um, and I'm, I'm just starting to enter this once more and jump into to the game and, and uh, you know, give them my attention again. Um, and just come around, around to that stage where it's something I feel I, I want to and, and need to do. Um, but there, there's been, as I said, some fantastic work on them and there has been um, you know, a great advance, of course, in our technology and our understanding of their host. And so there's all sorts of fabulous, not enough, but there's all sorts of fabulous uh, imagery uh, now of these animals. And so, and there are new collections, um, some of which have been described, some of which have not. So there's all sorts of stuff on the shelf just waiting for, you know, someone to come along and give it some attention, as there is with uh, many, many invertebrate groups. Um, so. This thymus that occurs in the callocytes, you can see its influence on the, the coloration. And these were back to the gray whale. Uh, on the stranded whale, you can see just the sheer numbers. And when it comes to um, the amount, and this is, this is also the only one you see those little uh, noodle-like structures on the belly or the ventral surface of the animal. Those are actually uh, its gills. And so we'll come back and look at a few of the anatomical features, but um, this is the only one with coiled gills. And so it, would be, it might be one of the features that distinguishes it from you know, the other species, of course. Um, again, we'll, we'll look at the anatomy but for now, just focusing on the numbers, you can see that their populations um, can actually be quite sizable. The populations of the Siamids or the whale lice on one whale in a group of whales uh, is going to far outnumber the population of the hosts themselves. Um, it's, it's been suggested that these are uh, parasites in the literature. They're called parasites, but again, it's a little bit difficult to assess. I mean, you can't ask the hosts uh, how they're feeling about this. It's, it's clear in, in, in some of their behaviors that they try to rub off the, um, the parasites, or it seems to be what they're doing. Um, the, the parasite load, or the, the load of whale lice, I should say, on the host varies quite a bit. Uh, you might have one on the nose or uh, near the blowhole of uh, El Delfinid, a dolphin, but you might have 7,000 or more, or maybe 12,000 on one gray whale or one right whale. Um, the mysticity, the uh, baleen whales tend to have uh, many, many more. These slow moving larger whales have many more whale lice than uh, typically than do uh, the smaller tooth whales. And so um, it was proposed at one time that in one of the papers, uh, there was a suggestion, I should say, that there was a mutualism that the, the whale lice would actually feed on the irritated uh, epidermal cells of the skin around the barnacles um, that were embedded in the, the whale's surface, uh, and that they would, uh, by that feeding behavior, dislodge the barnacles. Um, but in, in, in talking to um, John Henning, one, uh, a whale biologist who's, who's since passed, about uh, that particular instance and paper, it was pointed out that you know with stranded whales, those barnacles tend to, after days, uh, come off anyway. So it, le it just leaves it ambiguous. You know, it's a little bit difficult to, for us to tell, as you can imagine, what the true nature of the association might be uh, when you're dealing with moving hosts and many of uh, these species are more elusive than the gray whales we have migrating up and down our coast. They're just not ones that, like such as the beaked whales, not ones that we see um, as often or as easily. So um, the, the association is up for grabs. I, I'm not sure that the naming and, and the name we assign to this association really matters all that much because it's difficult to uh, box things up in a black and white fashion and say it's entirely parasitic or it's you know, uh, commensalistic and there's no influence. It's, it's, there's more gray area. Uh, and so what we do see though is that cyamids occur in oftentimes in wounds. Um, they're not causing the wounds. The, the wound might be caused by um, some sort of aggression or some sort of impact or uh, something like a cookie cutter shark. And so wounds, pre-existing wounds, do tend uh, to attract cyamids. Uh, 
part of the reason could just be the dynamics of flow uh, around the organism, but there seems to be more to it. And they do actually seem to feed on epidermal cells within the wound, so we'll, we'll look at that a little bit too. But again, with population sizes, the numbers can be quite large. Uh, you, you can be, this is, a, this is a gray whale that was actually found in the Western Pacific of Japan, uh, which isn't, as I understand it, as regular of occurrence, of course. But it was the case that they, they were finding um, you know, thousands on this one individual. Uh, when you look at subsistence harvest, uh, there's a, a paper that I was uh, examining on bowhead whales in um, the Arctic. And the records, someone actually tracked or tried to estimate the population size of these whale lice on bowhead whales that were caught over the years in these subsistence harvests. And um, this is the, or these are the data that they um, presented. So it seems to wax and wane and it's difficult to tell um, exactly what might be uh, causal in this case. Um, you know, the temperature of the Arctic waxes and wanes too as it climbs. Uh, it's, it's hard to say exactly, you know, why that's the case. Uh, but again, when they're looking at the, the number of whales that actually have, which is what you're, you're seeing on the y-axis here, the number of whales that have been uh, caught in these seasons that actually have cyamas, they're finding that um, typically uh, at least a quarter of those whales do have whale eyes. Um, how do we sample them? And, uh, uh, aside from those types of harvest. Um, this is obviously not the sampling method we used in, in uh, South Carolina when I was you know, studying this. Um, a lot of these specimens have come from the whaling days. And so uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, early collections, it's the case that on whaling vessels way back in the day, uh, individuals, naturalists, were bored and they were collecting just about anything of interest. Uh, and that included uh, the organisms that existed on the surface of the whales, in addition to whatever other samples they were, they were taking. So some of, some of these samples have uh, come to exist in different collections of the British Museum and uh, LA County Museum and especially museums in Australia and South Africa and other places across the globe um, as a consequence of uh, availability due to whaling. And then um, there are special instances, and we'll see if this can play, and and hopefully it does for, for you at home. Um, this I just grabbed the other day. Um, there are instances, of course, locally. This isn't too far from us, down on the Pacific coast of uh, central Baja, California. Um, he is rudely uh, taking these whale eyes off of the surface of that whale. Um, but So there, there are some sampling opportunities that exist that typically do not. Um, and so we will... Exit back. Um, oops. So if we look at the most common method, or the most common uh, avenue by which these things end up in jars on museum shelves and in petri dishes beneath light microscopes, uh, it would be strandings. And these days, uh, of course, uh, we are looking at liver samples and skin samples and samples from you know all the organs and trying to understand uh, as much as we can about these animals because it's, uh, it might be a sad opportunity in many instances, but it's an opportunity to, to learn more. To, to do to to gather data basically, and um, among those things gathered would be, as you can guess, the whale eyes. So most of the whale eyes in collections come from um, strandings. And then once we have those, of course, this is a shot of the British Museum. I spent some time there looking at specimens. Um, once we have those, then we have specimens tucked away um, for, for study, for uh, strange people like me who find them fascinating. Uh, when you visit a museum such as the Natural History Museum and there are um, some, some friends here from the uh, museum tonight, uh, what you're seeing in public exhibits is a very, very, very small slice of what actually is housed in that building. Uh, in fact, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the museum um, leases other buildings uh, in 
in order to just store large items um, such as uh, particular fossils. Uh, you know, you've got cabinets of fossils that are off-site and um, you can imagine that for something like whale bones and, and um, other specimens, you need a lot of space. Uh, but even with these little things and the jars that contain them, um, you need shelves and shelves and shelves of space. And it's the case that you, um, you know, if I walk through the Natural History Museum um, of Los Angeles County, I might see uh, half a dozen uh, exhibits dedicated or components of exhibits dedicated to crustacea. Uh, but if you go behind the scenes and you look in the collections room, uh, there are hundreds of thousands uh, of jars uh, containing, in some cases, many, many specimens. So there's a lot to look at and it's great that uh, people have, over time, that scientists over time have uh, stowed away uh, all of these specimens because um, you never know what is going to be found from them years and years down the line. And so um, there remain uh, undescribed species of whale lice. Uh, I'm presenting to you that, you know, there, there are over 30 species that we can talk about tonight, but I've got um, undescribed species of fishes and other things just in the classroom where I'm at, uh, not even you know, mentioning the many, many thousands that uh, likely exist in each museum. So uh, when you have these specimens and you take a look, uh, you can uh, explore them in all sorts of ways these days. Uh, I spent most of my time looking through a light microscope and learning how to operate a scanning electron microscope to look at their you know, external anatomy. So here you're seeing SEMs or uh, scanning electron micrographs of the mouth field and so those letters just indicate, again, say antennae, MX, would be what mouth parts called maxillae. Um, when these organisms develop on different uh, segments, you'll have the development of different types of appendages. And in this case, we're looking at the, um, the buccal field or the, the, the mouth field, which is about, you can see that 200 UM, that's 200 micrometers. Uh, that's a fifth of a millimeter. And so <laughs> this is, a, and we had to dissect those with forceps. And so um, this is a, a very tiny animal, but you, are, uh, you can get lost with SEM. You can dive in and really um, start to see uh, a whole forest of features. In fact, it's, at least for me, it was difficult to remain disciplined because once you put an animal under a scanning electron microscope, you start thing, seeing things that weren't really your target. And then you wander over here a little bit and I, I gotta see what that is. What is that little pore? What is this? What is that feature sticking out of their exoskeleton? Um, and so oh, that's another organism, which brings to mind a whole new world that I didn't even, um, you know, share with you. And that's a, you might have this whale louse on, um, you know, a, a gray whale, but on that whale louse, you might have algae growing or ciliates or some kind of marine fungus. And then on those, you'll have some kind of marine bacterium. So it's just layer after layer, there's a whole community. Um, and most of it's unseen. Right, and so uh, most of it's unseen to most people and even what biologists see can be taken to a new level with you know, the right techniques. And so uh, these are different species. That's uh, um, isocyamus, that's a species we described way back when. Um, on the right, on the left is cyamus. And so you can see these big curved mouth parts, these maxillopeds as they're called, don't exist in some of the whale ice and they do in others. Um, and so perhaps that's just an evolutionary loss. You know, in order to understand that kind Kind of thing, uh, you'd have to have a roadmap that uh, gives you an idea of how they're interrelated to each other, uh, what the evolutionary history or the history of speciation has been in that group. Uh, when we look at mouth part anatomy a little bit more closely, um, which I know is why you, why you decided to come out tonight. Um, you see that there, there are incisors and um, you've got uh, Lucinia mobilis is a, a, a description of a particular uh, portion uh, that's just superior to a molar process. And so when, if you are, uh, this is your field, if, 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 if you're into um, what's, what's going on with crustacean feeding, then um, there might be some insights here into what they're, they're actually doing. Because that's a question 
question that we have about their ecology and what are they, what are they actually eating? Um, what would be one way to find out? Well, you can get uh, fresh specimens, uh, which sounds challenging, but uh, now you know happens fairly regularly. And then you can look at their gut contents. So some researchers have researchers have done that. Um, and then some of the features that I might look at as I'm trying to, because one of my goals um, at the time when I was first looking at this was to uh, try to understand how these um, organisms are interrelated. You know, to uh, basically construct an evolutionary tree, what we call a, a phylogenetic hypothesis that uh, would uh, be our hypothesis of, of like I said, interrelationships. And to do that, um, you basically look at this collection from this host and this collection here and this collection here, and you look at this certain number of specimens and you try to examine them closely and spend time um, making those observations and recording those observations uh, to say, oh, well, we've got this uh, consistently occurring here in this organism. So if you look at this mouth part, uh, it might be a little bit difficult, but um, there are uh, six of these processes or uh, teeth, so to speak, on the incisor. In others, um, the number differs. So they might be consistently six in this one and consistently five in another. The maxillopetal palps that I mentioned, those curved mouth parts, they might be present in these and absent in these. And you go through a large list of those characteristics uh, and then um, we'll, we'll get to what we do from there to, to you know, to get those uh, ideas of the relationships. But when it comes to those, those mouth parts and what they're doing, here you can see we're back to skeleton shrimp. So the, the image here is not a whale house. The image here is one of the um, anterior end or the, the front end, the head of one of these skeleton shrimp, which again are fascinating animals to watch and much easier to get a hold of because they're, they're crawling around the docks all around the marinas here, um, living on algae. They live on uh, sponges. I've found them on scorpion fish. You know, uh, they're on hydroids um, frequently. So for you aquarists, they're on aglophenia and lidocarpus and all these different uh, hydroids. Um, but the interesting thing is this group that I mentioned before, the skeleton shrimp, that I believe are among the closest living relatives of, the closest relatives of the whale lice, um, they are also epizootic. That is, they also attach to, cling to other organisms. So it's, um, it's the case that um, they're, they're interesting in that regard. And I think, I'm not sure if there's a, let's see if this video will play. It's going to take us to Chrome. So hopefully at home you can see it. I just wanted to show you something living. Um, and and show you uh, what juveniles look like. Again, this is for a skeleton shrimp, but it's, uh, it's not too much of a reach uh, to say that the Siamids will uh, behave and do behave uh, similarly. So that red is the eye. Those are juveniles. That's a female. That, well, was, that was enlightening. That was a female that is covered uh, by the juveniles um, that you know, uh, have hatched from the eggs that she once housed on her ventral surface. And so we can go ahead and skip back. Perfect, and I'm doing my job. I heard somebody say it makes them itch. So, <laughs> so um, when we look at when we look at their feeding and nutrition, well, what's on a whale? You know, what what could they possibly be feeding on? And I'll just say, without there, there are multiple studies. I only put one of the early ones there, or cited one of the early ones there. But um, there are um, there is detritus. So there's there's dead organic matter that, that can be found in the guts of these organisms, the guts of cyamids and the guts of uh, the skeleton and shrimp too. Uh, when you look at um, their, when you analyze their gut contents, you also find diatoms. So there are algal cells, single-celled eukaryotes that um, it will grow in films on these moving hosts. And uh, we find them in the guts of the whale eye. So clearly they're ingesting them. And we also uh, find epidermal cells. And again, when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean the scientific community and the people who uh, have performed these studies. Um, but there, that, that makes it, uh, you know, very interesting. Here's a, here's a picture of a couple of diatoms. These are actually representatives of genera that are found on whales. And if you look at um, the flukes on the, the left and compare them to the ones on the right, you'll see the film on the right. Those are, um, those are diatoms in this case. And so uh, it's a lot of the coloration that you see on the, the surface of the whales is due to uh, these algal cells that are growing in films. And, and again, people 
uh, for decades, you know, decades ago, were interested in this sort of thing and ha examined whale ice. And then there are recent papers uh, where uh, they've done the same. Uh, when it comes to respiration, you know, these are animals that are performing cellular respiration. They need oxygen just like we do. Um, that uh, is. The, it is the case, sorry, that they have uh, structures that we refer to as gills, uh, presumably with easier transfer uh, or gas exchange across a thinner cuticle, a thinner exoskeleton. Um, they, they have elongate gills such as Siamis bupis on the left, fun name, Siamis bupis is from the um, humpback whale. And when you look at the ones in the middle, uh, we have kind of your typical um, Siamid um, with, you know, we've got isosiamis and, and, and then we have um, below that you'll see these mop-like gills. So let me try to move the mouse again. Uh, down here you have these kind of mop-like tufted gills and those are characteristic again of only one species, Neosiamis physoteris. And by the uh, specific epithet there you might understand that we're talking about a species that occurs on um, the sperm whale. And so that species is found only on the sperm whale. It's the only one with those gills. And so these are again examples of morphological anatomical features that we can compare from one one species to another. Um, when you look at the, the image on the right, you're looking at the development of those gills. And so that's, a, that's another layer. You might look at uh, what these are like in the adult animals, but you don't want to neglect what juveniles look like. And in fact, there are plenty of examples of researchers finding organisms that uh, appear new, uh, describing those organisms, only to later find out, oh, that's just the juvenile stage. And again, if you're in the marine science and you look at like a phylosome larva of a, a lobster, um, you'll, you'll think that you're watching a James Cameron film or something because it's very alien-like and very different from a lobster. And there are plenty of those cases. In fact, there was somebody down at, uh, Peter Bryant down at UCI um, uh, years ago was trying to make links between using DNA, uh, link uh, what was found in the water among the plankton to what the adult stage would be because that's not always so, so obvious. Um, and then again, there are other features if we zoom in, we see what have been referred to in the literature as uh, accessory gills or medial gills. And so I'm just giving you examples of how there's a little bit of variation here. Uh, when it comes to the reproductive biology, again, an important point. Uh, this is a female. You can tell immediately um, in either skeleton shrimp or uh, their kissing cousins here, the whale eyes, you, you can see immediately that's a female because of these broad plates. See there's four broad plates in the middle. Uh, those are called oastagites. Um, that's her brood pouch. And so that's where she will house her eggs and that's when, when they first hatch. Um, that's where the juveniles will be. Eventually they'll emerge from that, pat, that, that pouch. Um, but they do so as like miniature adults. And so they don't have that larval stage that I mentioned earlier for the barnacles, which means that they are tied directly to that host. Um, and, and so you would expect, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's largely what we find, you would expect a lot of host specificity then. Because if they had a larval stage, then they could, you know, you would imagine that they could go and potentially land on some other whale as a larva, uh, establish themselves, you know, uh, develop. Um, through a series of molts until they, you, you, we recognize what their adult form is. And they could um, then, you, you would expect there not to be such a tight association between a particular species of whale house and a particular host species. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, if we look at those a little bit more closely, again, this is a scanning electron micrograph. But if, if you look at the lower flaps of the brood pouch there, the lower plates, you'll see um, that there's a little egg right there. So if we continue here, um, we've got, is that my sign? <laughs> so we've, when you continue here, we've got um, a, uh, just a look at what the different kinds of whale lice might uh, uh, appear like. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to see uh, variation in the, the species, you know, from one to another if we're looking at a line drawing. Um, as opposed to a photograph. And so this, these are, this is platysiamis up top. These are common on beaked whales. The one on the upper right is an unnamed species. Um, it, is, it exists as one specimen. 
Um, and so, you know, it's, it's kind of this waiting game. Are we gonna find more of this guy? Um, then you have that one I mentioned with those highly recurved claws on the bottom. Uh, when it comes to the tooth wells, especially the, you know, delphinids, you usually end up um, seeing those carry much smaller parasites. So there are some genera, Scutus iamus, Sens iamus, where, uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, the individuals are quite small. Uh, they might only be millimeters across. And so you'll find these again in flaps around the eye and any kind of wound and flaps around the blowhole and, and around the genital area, etc. And they're hanging on with these highly recurved claws. They also have, if you look at that image on the upper right, they also have processes on their ventral surface um, that uh, you, would, you would think would help them in attaching to the well or, or, or staying attached to um, the host. It's important to note that there's some work by, you know, Vicki Roundtree and others um, actually uh, reporting uh, the movement of these animals. And I know that a couple of you in the audience might have actually seen these uh, whale lice moving upon the host uh, while live. So they don't necessarily stay in one particular spot in the whale, uh, as would a barnacle that is fixed in position. Um, they can migrate around a bit, and that's been, that's been recorded. Transfer uh, from uh, a host to a whale, whether it's stranded or not, uh, has been recorded too. Uh, so you can have these things crawling on your hand. Um, it's, it's the case that they attach rather well. They've been recorded on whaling vessels. There's one report of finding them attached to cables on whaling vessels days after the last harvest of the whale, still alive. Uh, but eventually they desiccate, they die. They can't live, uh, of course, out of the water. Um, and again, it's not such a leap. So as I get into the end of this here, it's not such a, a leap that uh, uh, to think that the skeleton shrimp are close relatives because they're found on uh, other organisms. This species described by Jody Martin, Gary Pettit, uh, the, the Natural History Museum years ago, uh, was found on deep sea crab mouth parts. They've been found on other crabs as well. They're, they're on hydroids, uh, on algae, et cetera. So um, I don't know what they have going on down there, you know, what they're actually doing, but they, they live on other organisms. And when, you know, one of the questions I always get is how do they get from one whale to the other if there's no uh, larval stage of the no dispersal stage in their uh, life cycle, well, it, it happens rather easily. Uh, and I can say that now with more confidence because there are videos of this happening uh, when it comes to a mating. Uh, and so, sorry, I didn't have a disclaimer for the image on the left, but um, there's play, there's aggression, any kind of contact. Um, if, if you look at some videos, the critter cams, uh, people interested in uh, sperm whales diving for, you know, a giant squid or, or whatever else, uh, Oftentimes they're learning more about the host than uh, whatever it is uh, else that they're, they're uh, you know, for such, I guess I should say I was, uh, what's coming to mind for me as I was watching a documentary on the hunt for the, you know, the giant squid. And what they did is they attached critter cams to sperm whales. And in the end, they didn't find any squid in that particular documentary, but they learned all sorts of stuff about sperm whales. And what's standing out in my mind is when they were diving, they were rubbing up against each other and there was a lot of contact, which relates to what I'm trying to say here. But there's also, again, there's, uh, there's play, there's nursing. Um, we can skip over this video because we're getting a little short on time, uh, but there, there's, there's video footage now of uh, nursing calves and, and you get transfer of whale ice that way. To come back real quickly, um, with these last few slides, I'm uh, just painting a picture of, of, of what we're finding out about the evolutionary history of this group. And what we do, for those of you who aren't familiar, is we look, this is a really, this is an abbreviated um, slice of a data matrix, but this data matrix with uh, all this coding of zeros and ones and twos well, those zeros and ones and twos relate to the traits of different characters that we observe on these different organisms, uh, such as the number of teeth I was talking about before. So maybe if there are four teeth, we code that a zero. If there are five teeth, we code it a one. Or uh, for us, eye color, uh, we'll code blue eyes a uh, zero, and we'll code brown eyes a one and green eyes, you know. So um, really these zeros and ones and twos for morphological anatomical data, um, they, are, they really are descriptions uh, for each of these species and each of the columns that you see is a different characteristic. And so back in the day, as you can see, I did this when I was, you know, 10 years old. Um, you, 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 
I had you know, 80 or so characters, characteristics, observable features for these organisms that I compared across all the species. And uh, you pump this into uh, computer uh, algorithms that give you, that are designed, and there's a lot of argument in the literature over those, um, you know, those models and how we treat that. And then, and then um, we arrive at accepted methods for reconstructing these trees. And so you put it into um, a com computer and you get a branching diagram that is your hypothesis based on those data of the interrelationships. And so uh, what you can see from the one that I first developed is that aside from Siamis um, or Sinai here from the, the killer whale, um, you have uh, Siamis being, you know, all, all of Siamis has each other's closest relatives. Now here uh, I have a strict consensus, which means the computer gave me uh, more than one tree, gave me more than one possibility, and you can reduce that and say, hey, what's common only to all of these trees? I wanna be conservative, and so that's why not all of these are completely branched, but um, when you have a hypothesis like that, when you, when you go through the motions of really making careful observations across all these specimens and then all these different collections uh, to come up with uh, such an evolutionary tree. It's, it's a roadmap for asking all sorts of really uh, interesting questions that you, you might have about their ecology, about um, the development of different features. And so here I have just some basic sketches of mouth parts that are associated with the species that were on those branches before. Uh, and so you can learn a little bit about how those mouth parts have evolved um, and, and what they're like in these different interrelated groups. Um, and so there has been work, not surprisingly, since it's been a while. Um, there has been some uh, great work done in trying to estimate these relationships from additional data and new observations, and that's the way science works, right? You wanna revisit things and see if you're corroborating what so-and-so did back when. And um, we've got uh, largely uh, agreement here with um, one done by um, Iwasa in uh, uh, Cerejo in 2018, um, and then you can see, and I think we're um, running a little short on time here to get uh, too deeply into this, but you can see the different species of isosiamus, uh, again, found mainly on, on tooth whales, uh, platysiamus, mainly on beaked whales. You can see uh, they're coming out as each other's closest relatives. Um, the individuals that we've named this way don't actually have to come out as each other's closest relatives, so it's getting some cooperation to our classification. We want our classification of what we call these organisms to reflect what we believe about how they're interrelated. So if we see some major changes on the tree and things say, oh, we've got Siamis over here and Siamis over here, um, then we have to reevaluate um, how we're classifying those organisms. And so uh, the classifications contain information on what we believe about relationships. And uh, real quickly, uh, one of the, the neat things about studying whale parasites, especially if you're interested in the host, is that um, you know if the hosts become separate, if the hosts actually um, diverge and you've got distinct populations populations that are reproductively isolated and they, you know, they eventually become what we would refer to as separate species by default because these parasites are locked onto these hosts, you also have those parasites become new species. So the vicariant speciation or the speciation of the host will, will drive and cause speciation of the parasites because they can no longer share genes, they can no longer uh, reproduce with each other. Uh, classic examples of that would be you know, squirrels across the Grand Canyon. You'll see this in most major you know, university biology texts and uh, the Isthmus of Panama, which we know started you know, emerging from the sea this, uh, due to tectonic activity 12 million years ago and probably completely separated the marine species that used to be um, you know, continuous populations about three and a half million years ago or so. So uh, that gives us some information um, that we can use. And uh, real quickly, there is work by uh, John Seeger and um, Ada uh, Kalasuska uh, in 2005 that um, examined examined specimens on right whales in particular, but examined, they examined specimens on right whales 
um, in different populations in different you know in different areas in the southern hemisphere and the and in the northern hemisphere. When you look at these uh, several different populations uh, that are disparate geographically, um, and you look at their whale eyes, where I would have recognized three, they recognized for the right whale whale eyes nine species, and so um, it seems to be the case that the a lot of these uh, are actually more diverse than um, I, you know, at least I was able to pick up using a microscope al alone. So when you look at um, DNA sequence data and you apply the same methods, um, you end up um, learning a lot more about how isolated these um, different organisms might actually be from one host population to another and therefore uh, how diverse uh, they might actually be. So there's some cryptic species is what we would say uh, in this case. There is some other work, uh, phylogenetic work using DNA data here um, and there, there are some big parallels, there are some differences too. Um, we don't need to dive into that um, too deeply but um, again they're giving us roadmaps. And then um, you know, there was just a paper you can see on my on my birthday here. Um, there was a, a paper just recently, um, just days ago, um, espousing the idea that these populations of killer whales up north should receive um, designation as separate species. Well, that immediately brings to mind the idea of getting whale eyes from individuals of these populations to see how divergent they are, because that might uh, show some indirect evidence to, to either support or refute that idea. Um, while, I'm, while I'm mentioning that, uh, one of the interesting things to do, and I won't go over this tonight, but just present it to you, uh, would be to take what's, what we believe about whale phylogeny or whale uh, cetacean, I should say, interrelationships, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Take what we uh, believe we know about their evolutionary history and then compare it to the parasites. And there are different uh, programs for doing this now than there were when I um, started the work years ago. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of different programs that one can use to examine those interrelationships and see the degree of agreement. And, and again, it's because there's no free free swimming stage and because these whale associates tend to be so host specific that that sort of thing might be really interesting. And so, you know, there's a, this is a um, very large data set used to reconstruct whale phylogeny as well, but that's, that's one of the, or cetacean phylogeny, excuse me, and that's one of the, um, the other interesting outcomes. But you can only make those comparisons if you sit down and you look at uh, you know, the morphology and the DNA of the whale lysis as well. And so here would be a comparison on the upper right. You've got uh, a branching diagram that depicts uh, what uh, some researchers came up with for mysticete whales and then these, this is a slice of the ch one of the trees um, done recently in 2018 for the parasites upon them and that's the kinds of associations that you can then draw. Of course you do need to know um, where you need to know that Siamis um, seti is on uh, the bowhead whale and on the gray whale and etc. You need to know what the host uh, relationships are to make those comparisons but that's something that's you know of interest and so finally just some, some takeaways is, you know, with the, that phylogenetics work or that work on their evolutionary history, um, it, it seems to be the case that the whale parasites fall into two major groups or two major lineages, uh, one mostly associated with tooth whales, one um, entirely or almost entirely associated with uh, the mysticete whales. Uh, the genus Siamis, as it's currently defined, uh, it seems to be uh, monophyletic, meaning all the species within that genus uh, seem to be each other's, each other's closest relatives, so it doesn't really warrant any major revision. Uh, we know a lot more than we did, you know, decades ago, uh, but there, uh, as I say, the questions abound. There's a lot to, to try to un uncover about their ecology and what they, how they actually make a living, you know, on the surface of their host, uh, and so that's of interest. There's a lot of uh, I can just tell you right now uh, from experience as can, again, uh, many of you in the audience, uh, that 
there is all sorts of alpha diversity. There is all sorts of uh, diversity yet to be uncovered. In other words, there are lots of undiscovered species hugging these uh, moving islands. Uh, and I, I would predict that many of the species that have yet to be uh, found and, and named uh, and studied are ones that are going to be on the more elusive, uh, you know, toothed uh, cetacea, such as the zephyr or the, the beaked whales and some of the um, some of the different dolphins. And so um, anyway, that I hope answers um, some of the questions that you might have had about these uh, symbionts of the cetacea. And I'm going to hang around. I'll end it here. But I thank you again um, for enduring my little talk here, uh, for visiting. I'm ha and I'm happy to chat about these things uh, ad nauseum uh, after, <laughs> after the talk. So uh, yeah, feel free to hunt me down if you've got additional questions and we can, we can chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. That was wonderful. Um, are there any questions? We'll open it up for some discussions. I'll, I'll let Todd lead the, the questions. Please help. But Todd, just a reminder to repeat the questions so those yes, at absolutely. home can hear it too. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Damn. As a fan of the um, moving islands, <laughs> I appreciate learning about the little buggers a little bit more that are hanging out on them. Um, and I, I had no idea that the right whale callosities were white because of life. So thank you for that. That was cool. And I always like a little extra. Oh, nice, you know, nice. Learning. Um, you had some really beautiful line drawings. And one of them you mentioned was an undescribed uh, and only an individual specimen. Yes, what yes. Was the host moving island on that? The host uh, for that one is actually a beaked whale that washed up in um, around Cape Town, I believe. So that one I um, was loaned uh, by Peter Best uh, at you know in South Africa, and so um, yeah, I was I was hoping for I was hoping for um, additional specimens to come to light, but as you can imagine, that doesn't happen too often, and so then you're stuck with this conundrum: do I do I describe a new species based on one specimen without understanding a little bit more about its variation? Um, and you know they, that that answer is difficult. You could say, well, if I don't, who's going to know about it? Uh, someone can come along and reassess things or add data, but you know, otherwise, it's a specimen on the shelf that if I hadn't mentioned tonight, no one in the world would know about. And so when I get, uh, you know, when I go off the road on the way home tonight, uh, all that well lost knowledge is gone, and nobody's ever. No. <laughs> No, but you get what you get. What I'm saying, it's uh, it's it's worthwhile to share. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hoping that. Yeah, so it's it's worthwhile to uh, sometimes uh, put information out there, even if you you don't uh, you don't know everything that you would like. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, is there any like variation in generation time, like depending on like interspecific interactions? Like, do species that are maybe more solitary have like do do their whale lice uh, have like longer generation times before like they reproduce just because of that like you know keeping genetic diversity up like and they don't want to you know start to uh, inbreed if like let's say like beak whales that are maybe not yeah yeah. So the, the the question deals with population size versus um, uh, generation times and reproductive cycles, and that's a really easy one for me to answer. Uh, and that's because I have no idea. Um, and that's <laughs> it's it's uh, that's a, it's a very good question actually, and uh, it's it's one of the problematic things about. The fact that these animals are on moving hosts and hosts that are offshore and not as accessible, but um, you know, th those are questions that are totally worth exploring, and that's it's part of what I was meaning about all this undiscovered ecology. You know, and we can start to get at what they're we can start to get that what they're feeding on because we have specimens. Um, we can examine their mouth parts, and you can use electron microscopy and transmission, uh, you know, TEM transmission electron microscopy to examine the organs within. You know, their internal morphology as well. Um, I imagine there's some 
other molecular tagging that we could do too that would shed some some light on things. But um, otherwise, when it comes to their their actual interactions, you'd, you'd probably have this very short window uh, in something like a stranding, or you'd be limited to certain species, uh, such as those on the right whales, which you can approach too, as I understand it, and you know places like Patagonia and elsewhere. Um, and, and gray whales, which are you know the, the friendly whales uh, as we as they're called because you can go and actually uh, have tours that that might or might not you know provide access uh, directly to an animal a host that's caught living whale ice on its surface. But uh, I don't I don't know of anyone that's I don't know of anyone that uh, has done any extensive study of the living. Uh, you know, living organisms on the host just because of the logistics, yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Oh, sorry, go ahead. How much of your time is spent running off to see a dead whale and get samples on it, and how much in the lab? These are all easy questions. How how much of my time, no, that's, 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 a, that's a great, great question to ask. Um, it's how much of my time is spent chasing down um, these specimens or looking at things during strandings. And that's easy because I don't. I spend almost all my time uh, teaching youngsters at a school down in Newport Coast, uh, which is a fantastic site. I love the school down there, about 550 students. And I teach environmental science, marine science, AP biology, that sort of thing. So this is all from work that um, I did a little bit of during a dissertation at UCLA and did mostly for a, a master's thesis in marine science um, in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, way back when, uh, which is fantastic because when you're doing this kind of work, uh, what I'm really doing is not chasing down strandings, although, you know, I've seen strandings and I've been to uh, a necropsy on the beach uh, for a whale um, that had stranded. Um, Otherwise, you know, it's all coming from museum specimens. And so when you do a study like this, people will send you museum specimens from around the world if you request them. Um, but you also get to travel to different cities and visit those collections, which is a safer bet when it comes to the collections because they're not in the mail. I did have a specimen, an important one, lost in the mail once, uh, which was uh, not pleasant for me. Um, and so I don't wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it, but it's the case that, you know, you. A lot of these specimens, they're historical collections. It might, you know, there are special specimens that bear the name. They're the ones of the species. They're the ones that individuals used uh, in their description. And so they have a special status. They're called tight specimens. And so those are usually aren't, you know, being shipped around by FedEx anywhere. Um, and you've got to go to the museums, which is a, you know, a great experience. So the pictures I had, the few pictures I had of the British Museum, for instance, were from a trip there where I spent, um, you know, a couple weeks at a visit desk with a microscope, you know, roaming around and looking at dead stuff, which is <laughs> what I like to do. Um, but yeah, there are stranding programs. Uh, there are uh, rescue programs and, and there, are, um, there are networks, uh, individuals that go out and respond to strandings and take care of business. And they're very good about um, taking measurements of the host and doing things like, you know, collecting and saving whale ice. And so eventually those make those types of collections and efforts bring the tissues of the specimens or whatever else to the individuals um, that are working on them. So. Or they're housed in a collection, and then eventually, you know, people know where to go. Is there anything that eats the lice or feeds the You know, I don't see anything in the literature, but um, there is a, you know, casual reference of seabirds eating lice. So the whales are coming up to this, the surface, of course, and while at the surface, um, it's likely the case, right? this is speculation, but it's likely the case that a lot of those would be picked off by, by seabirds. Um, when it comes to organisms living on the whale, there's, there's no evidence of any kind of uh, carnivory, there's no evidence of any other animals that are consuming the whale eyes. Um, barnacles have limbs with special structures that are filtering, you know, plankton um, that are emerging from the, the test that they live within. Um, they're, they're not affecting the whale ice at all. Um, and I, I don't know, it, you know, that'd be another interesting thing to know. I don't know how often when, um, 
you've got these large populations of whale ice on you know, slowly moving baleen whales um, that are also affected by lampreys and other, other types of fishes. I don't know how often uh, bony fishes, for instance, are uh, pecking off the whale parasites. So, you know, that would be an interesting little tidbit, but there's no real uh, record of that. But I would imagine birds and fishes that would be the, the short response to your question, if I had to guess. How about we take oh, a sorry. question from home? Sure. And then we'll get to yours. How about we do more Okay, um, Sarah has a question from home. Is it possible to gather data from dead specimen or fossils to understand the symbiotic association? Ah, okay. Um, I would think there's no record of any fossils. So, um, although they have an exoskeleton, uh, there's no, you know, of course, the soft tissued organisms uh, don't tend to preserve well. You have to have very special conditions to, to get fossils in the first place of any organism. Uh, it's actually uh, the case that given that fact, we have an extraordinary array of fossils available at museums and other collections around the world. Uh, but when it comes to whale lice, I don't know of a single um, bit of fossil evidence for them. Uh, and of course, we have many, many fossils of, of uh, extinct and extant uh, whale species. But when, it, when you're talking about gleaning something about their ecology uh, from a dead specimen, say from a stranded whale, um, yeah, I would, I would think that would be one great avenue. Uh, you'd have, probably have a short window, uh, but I, w I would think you'd be able to learn a lot just from leaving them kind of in situ on the organism and taking those moments that exist or those hours uh, and having somebody, a, a carcinologist, crustacean pile, just really, you know, pay attention to what's going on. Uh, aside from, you know, a, as opposed to just grabbing them right off the whale and dunking them in a in a, in a jar. I, I did see a video of an individual pinning them. So there was a hobbyist, I think in Washington, who, who actually, uh, it, it was kind of cool to watch, but they, they actually had talked some, well, one of the uh, responders into gathering some whale ice and giving them a subsample. And then at home they were organizing them and uh, measuring them and they were pinning them like insects onto a board. And so, uh, but, the, but uh, in that instance, there were many on the whale and it, it might have been uh, you know, that, that would be the example of an opportunity to just, uh, if you could get up close and, and look at them, you might, you might learn something. So, uh, thanks, Sarah. I was wondering, when you talk about them migrating on the whale, yeah. do they migrate individually or is it like a family? They tend, to, well, uh, this is, uh, so the question is whether or not when, when they're moving on the whale, if they migrate in groups or they're migrating individually. And um, the answer to that, I think, is just another one of these things that's difficult to address, but it's the case that many are moving uh, around. And so I don't know that there's any relation between uh, those that are moving together, but um, they, they tend to crawl uh, in such a way that it's, you know, it's more than one orphaned individual that's, you know, uh, finding a new path. It's uh, the case that you can have whole groups of them, you know, traversing portions of the, the host. Um, and in many cases, I should reiterate that uh, on certain hosts, especially tooth whales, you know, on a, on a Tersiops or Stenella or whatever else, you might uh, only have one or two of these uh, whale lice in the first place. And so uh, it's really on it's really on the um, humpbacks. Uh, to some degree, the bowheads, the humpbacks, uh, the gray whales, and the um, right whales that you f you find many hundreds or thousands of individuals on, an indi on a given host. But if you look at the, yeah, you look at the videos, you'll see them kind of teeming and, you know, moving around a bit. Another interesting question might be what's going on with the juveniles because, I, you know, they seem, seems like they're tucked in a little bit better and it seems like the adults um, are in many cases over those juveniles, but in other uh, instances in footage I see, uh, they seem to kind of be out on their own and exposed. And so I don't know how many of those get dislodged, if any, you know. So um, those, are, those are just difficult things to get at. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Any of these uh, lice toxins that are 
toxic in any way? Um, probably if you ate too many. No, the question is. Uh, <laughs> are they edible? No, uh, if, if the question is, are well, we've got a new question. Are they edible? Are they toxic in any way? Um, I would, I would think that they wouldn't pose any threat whatsoever. I don't, I don't know of any reason that they would be toxic. Uh, I, you know, normally when something like that is the case, it would have to do with what they ingest or have to do with some mechanism for an organism that doesn't get around so well to, uh, in a uh, mechanism of defense. But um, I would suspect that if you wanted these as uh, crouton-like toppings for your salad that you would be just fine. <laughs> Don't, they don't. They don't look very meaty. There are some, you know, a lot of these skeleton shrimp and some of the whale lice in life before the cute, the uh, before the exoskeleton becomes opaque with preservation. We normally when we preserve these, we preserve them in um, 70 to 95 percent ethyl alcohol, uh, and that uh, leaches out their color. They turn the same color as what you see this platycyamus specimen um, showing. But in life, you can often see through. And this is what makes the skeleton shrimp so fascinating when you watch them uh, in life. I don't say that of whale ice because you just don't have the access to have them in biology labs. Uh, but what's, what's cool is you can see through the exoskeleton, you can see the musculature, you can see the heart beating, you can see the gut, you can see the fluid um, moving around inside the body. And so um, they're that this is a response to feeding upon whale eyes, uh, but that made me think of, well, what's really, you know, what would you really be getting out of that? Um, it's the case that, you know, they, they have muscle tissue, which is what we're eating if we're dining on lobster or crab or shrimp, right? But it's uh, naturally, these are very tiny organisms, um, but it, um, it just brought to, uh, the image to me of, um, you know, being able to look at that internal anatomy as well. So it's not all about spines and claws and the lengths of their antennae and the number of segments. There's a lot to learn from, um, you know, sectioning these animals or, or examining these animals and their living form to see what's, you know, going on inside as well. So let's um, let's wrap it up. But one one more thing: Do you think you you, you showed a bunch of you showed fluff photographs, but you also showed some scientific illustrations? Can you explain to everybody how how you do scientific illustration on something so small? Ah, uh, yes. Um, when well, when you're when you're talking about illustrating, and I I guess I can go back to one of these here. Let me find one. When you're, let's go to the mouth, because this is only, you can see I've got 300 microns, 300 micrometers. Um, a thousand micrometers, if you're not familiar with juggling those, those units, a thousand micrometers is one millimeter. And so that's a pretty small mouth field. And you have to take really fine forceps and tease apart these different um, appendages in order to put them on a slide, to examine them, to count things, to measure things, and so that's difficult. When it comes to drawing, which was the question, how do we draw these, um, there's something called a camera lucida, which is uh, basically a mirrored system that you can, uh, you can attach to the head of a microscope, a light microscope, and so as you're looking through the microscope, um, you can dedicate one of the ocular lenses, the one that you're peering through, uh, to your eye, and you can and have the other ocular actually, I mean, I, I, let me s specify that one of, those, one of the, the fields of view will be your direct line through the scope to the specimen. So you're looking at the specimen with one of your eyes. Your other eye uh, will go to this mirrored system that will let you see your hand and a pen or a pencil and then your brain will superimpose them so you can actually uh, look at the specimen under the scope and see your hand and the pencil tip at the same time and you can, you can trace those parts. Of course, we have such fantastic uh, microscopes now and optics that uh, there are also ways to um, capture photographs that you can then convert into to line art, but it's often easier, as you can see, it's easier to see what's going on if you reduce this, this field of view of the organism uh, to lines rather than trying to take in uh, an actual, you know, an actual image. So was that yeah. clear enough? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it's, it's pretty cool because you can, you can basically trace anything that you see. The short answer to that was, oh, you trace it. You can trace anything that you see in the microscope. Yeah. All right.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd.